So your Shvat is here. Almost. Erev, Erev, Erev. And um, it was decided by the committee that we interrupt just this once our learning of the Lukut Teda and Teda Ed, which we've been doing now with the help of the grace of God and frankly the generosity of uh, a number of people, especially the Khanan Fund, who have made this all happen and they deserve everybody's thank you, that we should do something that is Yud Shvat centric. And um, you've been sent the Maimir, Basilagani. It's only 288 lines, so figure an hour and a quarter, maybe an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> or actually, without the footnotes, it's only 129, not 191 lines. We're not bound by the text on this particular occasion. We'll talk about Yud Shvat, we'll talk about Basi Lagani, we'll read excerpts, and we'll have, if you will, a Fabrengen within the framework of this Maimir. The the story of Bossi Lagani is quite compelling. It's an interesting story, and it's a pretty awesome story. The previous Rebbe had a stroke sometime during the summer of 1945. Rumor has it that the reason for the stroke, what brought the stroke on, was the fact that he came across some correspondence from Hasidim who had either survived the Holocaust, who had written the letters earlier during the war, who described the murder of Anash and Rige in Latvia, where the Rebbe's closest people were murdered. Rebbe Chidemasmid, Rebbe Prachafegin, and, and many like that, Rebbe Leber. So the rumors, the story goes that when the Rebbe read this letter, the previous Rebbe read about the death, the murder of these incredibly, incredibly close people to himself, he never suffered a stroke. And there are actually pictures, or one picture that I know of, where well, you can see the left side of the Rebbe's face is disfigured. It was apparently a minor stroke, relatively speaking, because within a few weeks he was back and function, although the Rebbe in general, the Friedrich Rebbe, was altogether a miracle. His physical health was incredibly poor, and he was full steam ahead. He was very dynamic and very creative and very visionary and driving the... the infant American Lubavitch or Western Lubavitch that were as fast and as hard and as furiously as he possibly could. But one of the effects of this stroke was that the Rebbe stopped writing and saying my modem, 1945. No more my modem were written nor recited from that point forward. Now, the fact of the matter is that we have my modem from the Friedrich Rebbe all the way up till his histalkus, till his passing in Toshin Yud. And the reason for this is because the Rebbe decided that he would take my modem that he had written earlier, especially my modem written in the years that he lived in Russia and in Western Europe, the early years after his departure from Russia, which most Hasidim living in America had no access to that material, and reprinted. And they were redistributed as though they were original Maimodim. In other words, Maimodim from Tavshin Vov, which is 45-46, and Tavshin Zayim, which is 1946-47, and Tavshin Ches, and Tavshin Tes, and Tavshin Yud are essentially old Maimodim that the Rebbe gave out again, the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Rebbe gave out again, for the most part verbatim, word for word, but he renamed them, instead of them being just a reprint of a maimed of, let's say, Peivov or Pehe or Peches or Peites, which are years during the 20s, they came out as though they were original. And um, that's why we have my modem from Tavshin Vav till Tavshin Yud. Incidentally, my father-in-law told me, that his father, Abnis Nemanov, told him that after he left Poking, after he came out of the DP camps in Germany, and was living in France, and was heading the yeshiva there in Brinois, he actually wrote the previous Rebbe a letter about the possibility of coming to see him. And of course, nobody had any money, and it would have been an incredible undertaking to make such a trip, but the Nissen was a chassid shayid, and a kusher, and he would have somehow figured it out, and the previous Rebbe wrote him a letter saying, in effect, there's no point for you to come, I'm not writing chassidus, and I'm not saying my modem, 
So it's interesting. The Rebbe wrote to him, you're coming to see me and there's no memorem, so what would be the point in effect? Um, how to interpret the story and what greater depth lies therein, I don't know. But this is the story, that, it's a true story. I heard it from my shved. But the Maimorim kept coming out, as I explained to you, because they were uh, old Maimorim being redistributed, redisseminated, and so forth. Now, there were some changes made to the Maimorim, because the Maimorim that he was now distributing were Maimorim that he had written and said in the 20s, in the pays in Russia, for the most part. And in Russia, the Maimorim of the previous Rebbe were long, and in some cases, exceptionally long, extraordinarily long. Consequently, when the Rebbe gave them out for a very different audience, for an American audience and for an audience of Hasidim who were not nearly as initiated as the Tmimim, to whom the Maimorim were spoken and written 20-something years earlier, so the Rebbe wanted to, I guess, make it a little bit easier on people. So he would divide a Maimir into two. So what became a Maimir that he may have said on one occasion was now distributed to be studied on two or three occasions. He would also add new prefixes to the Maimorim, to Haschalos, to Maimorim when he divided a Maimir in two, so the second Maimir needed a new beginning, which was written in the late 40s. And he also would write summaries, Kitsurim. At a certain point, the Rebbe encouraged his son-in-law, our Rebbe, who was known in those days as the Ramash, to publish the Maimorim in Kuntresim, in pamphlets. Now, it's hard to know who pushed whom. Did the Rebbe push the previous Rebbe or did the previous Rebbe push the Rebbe? It's very difficult to figure out who was motivating who. But one thing is certain, that our Rebbe had an obsession to get as much of the writings of his father-in-law, the Rebbe de Shved, as he calls him, the Friedrich Rebbe, to print. There is a volume of Igris Kedish, I think it's Chelik Tezvov, which was published a year ago, which is a wonderful volume of Igris. In it, you read about the correspondence of the previous Rebbe with his daughter, the Rebbe Tzinchaya Mushka, and the Rebbe, our Rebbe. It's very, very personal and full of very, very interesting and delectable insights or windows into the unique relationship that Rebbe and the previous Rebbe had. And one of the things that becomes very apparent from reading that volume of letters is how much the Rebbe celebrated every word and every thought and every story that the previous Rebbe would share with him or with the public. And he, he, he obsessed over it. He was so excited about the idea of the Shemusha Shel the stories which the previous Rebbe so generously shared. I mean, there's a letter from the Rebbe to the previous Rebbe where he writes to him how much he thanks him for having written him a long letter, a micht of toichni, as he called him, a substantive letter with all kinds of stories and ideas and attitudes. And he says, Mir felt God asach, special in vasarum chasidis is. I think those are the words exactly. The Rebbe writes to his father-in-law, I am lacking an awful lot especially when it comes to what is around Hasidus as opposed to the Hasidus itself. And um, the Rebbe was always finding ways and excuses to have the previous Rebbe write and publish more. And the Rebbe undertook to see to it that whatever the previous Rebbe wrote should be brought to print. He would edit it and he would push the various people who were involved in these efforts, the Zalman Garari and... Um, Reb Shmuel Zalmanov, I believe, was involved. Rabbi Chadakov was involved in publishing a letter from the previous Rebbe in German, a translation to German. There's a whole story about that. And in America, that continued. The Rebbe was a chassid. He loved the Friedrich Rebbe, and he loved everything the Friedrich Rebbe wrote and said, and was very excited and heartened by the, the, the revelation of the spirit of Hasidus. In other words, it wasn't just the scholarship, the intellect, and the ideas of Hasidus as a philosophy and a theology, but the life of Hasidus, which is so richly brought forward in the Sikhs and the letters of the previous Rebbe, which are full of stories and, you know, Hasidische Werter, Hasidische thoughts that are like little diamonds that glisten and shine and gleam. And um, consequently, the Rebbe was very excited about the possibility of publishing the Maimorim of the previous Rebbe. So it's hard to know who pushed whom, but in 1947-48, Tavshin Ches, the Rebbe started to actually give out the Maimorim of the previous Rebbe in printed pamphlets. 
and he wrote notes, footnotes on the bottom, by the instructions of the previous Rebbe. And in this new book that was published a few months ago about the Rebbe Zalman of Ashalom, that's called Bechol Beisi Neman, who they, they so candidly tell the story how Rebbe Zalman Gerari felt that it was wrong for the Rebbe, who was at that time not the Rebbe, he was known as the Ramash, to have his footnotes published under, on the same page as the previous Rebbe's Maimed. And he actually said to the Rebbe, I'd prefer if you put your footnotes in the back of the book so I can rip out that page and throw it in the garbage. Because he felt that on a Maimed of a Rebbe, nobody's notes should appear. And somehow this objection reached the previous Rebbe, whose comment was that the Rebbe, his son-in-law's notes on his Maimorim, Whereas the Tzemach Tzedek's notes on the Lukot which are actually printed in the text itself. The previous Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, wanted very much that the Rebbe should publish his notes under the Maimorim. So, Tovshin Ches, Tovshin Tes, Tovshin Yud, that's about two and a half years. Many Maimorim were not just given out by the previous Rebbe, but actually published and annotated by the Rebbe. Some of those notes are extraordinary. The note about Maseras Nefesh, the note about... Um, the Zayi Mitzvah's Darabonon, and Zayi Mitzvah's Bnei Neich. There's some wonderful, wonderful notes from the Rebbe uh, published in the bottom of the Maimorim that came out in those years. And for whatever occasions, whether it was Yom Tif, it was Hanukkah, or Purim, the previous Rebbe would give out a Maimed or a series of Maimorim, and as I explained to you, they were really, really reprints, rehashes. Now let's fast forward to Yud Shvat. Yud Shvat, as you know, was the previous Rebbe's yard site for his grandmother, the Rebbe Tzendifke, the Friedrich Rebbe's father's mother, who had a Riches Yomim. She passed away in 1914. I She was probably around 80, I figure, maybe older. She lived in Lubavitch. The previous Rebbe was very, very close to her grandma, his grandmother. She actually probably was the second greatest influence in his life after his father, when the Rebbe was a child, when the previous Rebbe was young, his father was sick a lot, and he traveled much. And whenever the Rebbe Rashab traveled, he traveled with the Rebbe, with his wife, the Rebbe Sinshten Nesoda. And most times, the previous Rebbe, who was a boy of five, six, seven, eight, nine, was left alone in Lubavitch, and his grandmother looked after him, and she raised him, and she told him stories, and she taught him how to wash Negelvah, said the same way to Ani. She was an incredible Yiddish Shamayim. She's the one with the story about eating for davening rather than davening for eating. And she passed away Friday, Yud Shvat, Aderes, Tafresh and Dalet. Um, and this was a yard site that the previous Rebbe used to commemorate, mark, because it was his grandmother's yard site, and it was a grandmother whom he knew well. Three days later, Yud Gimel Shvat, the 13th of Shvat, was the yard site for his own mother, Rebbe Sinshten Nesara. She passed away on a Shabbos, and the previous Rebbe was in Chicago at the time, and the Rebbe, our Rebbe, was in New York, and the Leviah took place, I think, Monday or Tuesday. The Leviah was postponed, so the Rebbe could see people who had come to spend time with him. Yechidus, his mother's Leviah waited so that the Rebbe could continue seeing Hasidim. So the Rebbe, in Tavshin Yud, in 1950, prepared a maimer that was meant to be distributed for Yardzeit. But here's the part of the story that's really interesting, and I think compelling. As I explained to you, all of these Maimorim were, re, were repeats. They were old Maimorim that were again redistributed for occasions. Well, the Maimor Yud Shvat, Bosi Legani, Tavshin Yud, which officially was given out for the yard sites of the Rebbe's grandmother and mother, was a Maimor the previous Rebbe had said, Shabbos Parshas Boi and B'Shalach Tov Reish Pei Gimel. 1923, two successive weeks, Boi and B'Shalach the previous Rebbe said, the Maimer Basilagani. In other words, the Maimer Basilagani, as we have it from 1950, is divided into four parts. Five chapters for Yud Shvat, five chapters for Yud Gimel Shvat, five chapters for Purim, and the last five chapters are for the Rebbe Rayatz's father's Yardzeit, Beis Nissen, the Yardzeit of the Rebbe Rashab. In other words, the Maimer Basilagani is for the most part the Maimer of Yardzeit, Maimer of Ilula, of Tzadikim and Tzadkonias. But the Rebbe had said the Maimed in Pei Gimel in 1923 in two weeks, which meant that when he said the Maimed originally, it was longer. It was ten chapters one week, ten chapters the following week. And the Maimed didn't begin Basi Lagaira. The Maimed began Rehiva Yetzema Yeimaze. And when the Maimed was prepared for print in Tafshin Yud, the first ten or fifteen lines were simply 
erased. In some place down the page, you can see the Maimah begins, and the Maimah we have begins, Basi Lagani. Now here's the intriguing part. That Shabbos, Boy Pegimo, was the first time our Rebbe met the Friedrich Rebbe. In other words, on the Shabbos, the Rebbe showed up in Rostov, his Shalom Aleichem, to the Friedrich Rebbe. And remember, the Rebbe was at that point 20, going on 21. He had never met the Rebbe Rashab, the Friedrich Rebbe's father. This was to be his Rebbe, to the exclusion of all others. The first Maimit he heard was Basi Lagani. And it's, it's, it's just compelling to think that 27 years later, the Maimit the Rebbe would leave our Rebbe with was the Maimit Basi Lagani. And it only um, enhances further the attitude that the Rebbe would so often underscore that the previous Rebbe's Maimed Basi Lagani is not simply a discourse, a Maimed, but that in fact it's a tzavo, it's the will, it's the final testament, so to speak, of the previous Rebbe in which he leaves instruction and inspiration for our generation. Yeah, just a little detail. In the, first of all, the Maimed of Pei Gimel is printed. You can see the first version, the first draft of the Basi Lagani. It was printed sometimes in the 1980s, in the Mems, and you can see how it begins, and about 15 lines down in the Maimed and in the manuscript, it says Basilagani. And when it was redone in 1950, it was decided to begin Basilagani. And in the Sefer of Pei Gimel, the original version of the Maimed and the index of Maimod, there's a footnote that when the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, gave out the Basilagani the first time, he made an observation. And his observation was, and I quote, Dos is a balabatish and maimer. And he translated, Medem maimer kem inverni berzicha balabos. End quote. In English, this is, it doesn't go over well in English because this is a pun. He said, this is a balabatish and maimer. Now literally, a balabatish maimer means a layman's discourse. But the word balabatish, in addition to meaning layman's, ordinary person, also means a master. He says, this is a masterful discourse, or a discourse for mastery. And he explained, by studying this Maimed, a person can learn how to master himself. And we all know that the themes of the Maimed Basi Lagani are, in fact, the mandate and the mission statement for our generation. The Rebbe clearly, over the course of his leadership, brought to fruition all of the ideas in the Maimed that the previous Rebbe had written, or distributed officially for the yard sites of his grandmother, mother, and father, but as the Rebbe would say, it turned out to be Maimed of Hilula, the Maimed of Histalkos, it's the Friedrich Rebbe's Maimed, which is his will, um, which has within it message, inspiration for our times. And so many of the basic ideas and attitudes which are so central to the Lubavitch of today are at the heart of the Maimed Basi Lagani. I mean, beginning with Basi Lagani. What does Basi Lagani mean? that God wants this world to be his garden. And instead of him having to be confined to a house, that Hashem should live in a Beis HaMikdash, which is a limited environment, we should affect that instead of it being it should be that every Jew should become a sanctuary and a home for God. And said more broadly, and this of course is the theme of this Maimed, that Nesava HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Lies Leis Baruch, Dire Betach the mission that man, that human beings, that Jewish people have on planet Earth, is to make this world a home for God. And of course the Maimed goes on to say, how do you make a home for God? You imitate the original model, the original Beis HaMikdash. And we're introduced to such ideas as Iskafi and Ishapche, Karbonis, Shtus de Kedusha, transforming Sheket into Keresh, Tzivas Hashem, Midas HaNetzach, Bizbuz HaEitzris, and so forth. I'm sorry that I'm not delving into all of this, but we don't have all night. We have only half a night. Um, but these are ideas that, if you're at all familiar with our Rebbe, you know how central these points, these themes, which are the previous Rebbe's Bossi Lagani, uh, are represented in the Rebbe's leadership, in the Rebbe's teachings, in the Rebbe's giving, and so forth and so on. So, for your Shvat Tov, you do this Maimba was published. And as, of course, the Rebbe writes in one of his notes, entries in his diary, that it was Friday afternoon. And as could be expected, everything in Lubavitch 
<laughs> that involved the Rebbe in those days was on time, but last minute. And the printers had brought like 15 or 20 or 50 copies of the pamphlet, Kuntas Ayin Dalad, Basilagani to 770 for Shabbos. And the Rebbe took one of these pamphlets, ran upstairs, he went into the previous Rebbe, and the previous Rebbe was already dressed for Shabbos, he was wearing a sertuk and a gantel and a shtraimel, and he was saying, Hoidu Pas and the Rebbe put down the Kuntas Ayin Dalad, Basilagani, and the previous Rebbe nodded an acknowledgement, thanks. And the rest of the copies were laid on the tables of 770 for people to learn Shabbos. What do you understand? They did after Shabbos, of course, they'd print many more. Now, uh, a typo was noticed on the front cover of this pamphlet that the previous Rebbe's name, which was written, Kveid Kedushas Admur Shlita, and then his name was missing the Yud. Shlita was spelled Shin Lamed Tes Aleph. And the Yud of Shlita, of course, goes on days, Yomim. The previous Rebbe would pass away less than 24 hours after the Maimah reached 770. He passed away Shabbos morning. And there's an interesting story while I'm telling stories, which is, might as well tell this one too, that the Rebbe was in his bedroom at around a quarter after seven in the morning, Shabbos. And he asked his nurse to bring him into his office, which was across the hall. So she took him off his bed and put him in the wheelchair, wheeled him into his office, and led him over to his desk. And the previous Rebbe sat looking around at the office, just sort of like sort of nodding at the svarim, the books. There was nobody in the room. and Just shaking his head like 15 or 20 minutes, which is a long time just to look at books. And then he asked her to bring him back into his bedroom, which she did. He asked that he take her, that she take him out of the wheelchair and put him back on the bed, which she did. And then he collapsed. 10 to 8, I understand, is the time of the histalkus of the... Friedrich Rebbe, of the previous Rebbe. And then immediately thereafter, the Rebbe announced that this Maimir is the Maimir of Hilula. Now, of course, what followed was a year of negotiating where Hasidim were begging the Rebbe to undertake the Nasius, and the Rebbe was hesitant or even refusing and insistent. I heard from a pretty good source that at a certain point early on, the Rebbe th- said that if people don't leave him alone, he'll just run away from New York and you'll never be able to find me. Later, the Rebbe stopped making such threats, but there were other issues, excuses, arguments, and uh, bases on which the Rebbe felt that this is not his place. The Rebbe Avram Parij wrote the Rebbe a letter almost immediately after the Histalkus, calling him the Rebbe Shlita, calling our Rebbe the Rebbe Shlita. So he showed this letter to Rabbi Chadakov, who was already then his personal secretary, and said, Cook, I'm a shugunet. look at this idiot, this fool. He refers to Mem Shin, the Rebbe said his own name, a Rebbe. could you imagine? Mem Shin, a Rebbe? So Rabbi Chadakov said to the Rebbe, sure, I can imagine it, and in fact, I agree with him that Mem Shin is a Rebbe. So the Rebbe said to Rabbi Chadakov good-naturedly, well, then you're crazy also. The Rebbe used to reach out to people, offer them his hand, and they would as is the custom in Chabad. In Polish, Hasidus, giving shalom to a Rebbe is a big deal, but in Chabad, you don't shake a Rebbe's hands. People would withdraw, and the Rebbe was left with his hand out. It wasn't so comfortable. And the Rebbe used to tell people, oh, you're also from those crazy folk who don't who refuse to shake my hand as if I'm some kind of a criminal. And, but the, it, the Rebbe was, so to speak, worn down slowly. Over the course of many months, the Rebbe became more accustomed to the idea of becoming a Rebbe. A little story, a little anecdote. Rabbi Hendel, Yitzchak Kain Hendel, of Shalom, Hendel Bracha, from Montreal. I heard the story directly from him. Learned in Atvatsk in Poilun, in the yeshiva, Temchit Mimim. And when he was in yeshiva, there was a Rosh Masifta, a Rosh Yeshiva named Rabdovid, Rabdovid Rikir. He taught the younger Shir in the Beis Medrash. The older Shir in the Beis Medrash was Rabbi Yud Leber, who was a Goan. Rabbi David Rikir taught the younger she was also a very big Talmud Chacham and a very big Yiddish Mayim. and he was not a Labav he was a Kotzker Chosid Kotzk in trying to describe to me how big a Yiddish Mayim he was Rabbi Handel told me that on Pesach they would close the kitchen because most of the Bachim went home and those Bachim who stayed behind the yeshiva paid Rabbi David to feed them and for Tem Chetim and Bachim to have eaten in his home gives you an idea that this was a special man he told me a whole story. There was an uprising in Temchat Mimim. The boys wanted to go to uh, 
Reb Yudel's shit, and they wouldn't let him. There was it's a whole whatever, not important. But this Reb David Lerikin was a Kotzker Chassid, and the Kotzker Rebbe passed away around thirty six or thirty seven, if I'm not mistaken. And the he left no children, so the community of Kotzker Chassidim, which was not a very large community, needed a successor. There was no biological successor. So they turned to this Reb Davidl and offered him the position. And he wasn't interested. And the Hasidim put pressure on him. So finally, he went into the Friedrich Rebbe, who was you know, one of the great tzaddikim of his generation, the great Hasidic Rebbe, and asked the previous Rebbe what he thought. And the Rebbe said, quote, a Hasidim beten is a simen as a do epis. If Hasidim requests and insists that you become a Rebbe, that itself is proof that there is justice, there's basis for you taking that job. Ober, continued the previous Rebbe, to bring out those possibilities, you have to turn your intestines inside out. And I heard from Rabbi Fuchs, Rabbi Hirschel Fuchs, Oliver Shalom, that the Rebbe then gave him a derech. The previous Rebbe told him what to do, how to prepare himself, after which he should accept, he should ascend to the Nesias of Hasidic Kotsk. In Kotsk, at that time, there was a Gvir. There was one rich Jew who essentially bankrolled all of the Kotsk efforts and endeavors because it was a very small Hasidus. And Abdavadl, this Abdavad Rikir, repeated to this Kotsker Gvir, this Kotsker rich Jew, the whole Yechidus. Hadarebbe had told him that if Hasidim asked, that itself is proof that there's something to talk about. And that he has to, his kishkis should be turned over in his stomach. And that the Rebbe had given him a whole derech and a whole seder and what he should actually do. So Rabbi Fuchs told me that this gvir remembered the first part of the conversation and completely forgot the second. In other words, as soon as Rabbi Davidl finished telling him what the previous Rebbe had said to him, the details of hachona, a preparation that he should undertake in planning to be a Rebbe, he forgot. And the understanding, of course, was it was information he didn't need, so the information didn't stay with him. But he remembered the first part. So Rabbi Hendel, all of Shalom, now, some 20, some 10 years later, 12, 13 years later, approaches the Ramash, the Rebbe, and says to him that he has proof from the previous Rebbe himself that the Rebbe must be a Rebbe. And the proof is that the previous Rebbe had said to the Rebbe David Lariket in Poyon, whom he knew, as Hasidim beten is a simen as do epis. The fact that Hasidim request is itself a proof that there's something to discuss. Now, of course, the Rebbe, I don't know how, but knew the rest of the story, and he looks at Rabbi Handel, who told him only the happy part of the story, if you will. If Hasidim asks, that's proof that there is something to discuss, and says to him, Perhaps my father-in-law said something additional. In other words, the part about... The kishke is turning inside out. This Rabbi Hendel very conveniently forgot to share with the Rebbe. But the Rebbe eventually did become a Rebbe. Now one story I want to share with you, because it's a very wonderful story. And it's also a story with some interesting meaning, in my view. And that is, I heard a story a few years ago that Chaim Lieberman, Olav Sholem, had related this story before he passed away. But now the story is printed in this book, Bechol Beis Inemenu, Rabbi Zalman Garari, has the story in the Sefer. And the story is that in the Pays, in the 1920s, the Rebbe and the Rebbe Shidduch was being negotiated. And the Rebbe and Chana, the Rebbe's mother, traveled to Rostov, representing her husband, Rabbi Levik, And she spent a considerable amount of time in the home of the Friedrich Rebbe. They used to call it in the old country, on to cook in the kala, to observe the kala and the kala's family up close. You know, today's system of dating, a man meets a woman in a completely unnatural environment, and everybody's on their best behavior, and they're all dressed so nicely, and you're going to find out the truth about a person. <laughs> what do men know about women? What do women know about men? In those days, uh, a woman would determine for her son or brother whom he should marry, which, which are, actually makes sense, right? And a brother would determine for her sister, what kind of boy she should marry, rather than a girl make a determination about a bocher and a bocher make a determination about a girl, which you know, in the best of times and with many, many dates still it leaves much to be explored. So the Rebbe Tzanchana came to the previous Rebbe's home and spent a few weeks 
seeing the family and the family dynamics and the rabbits and so forth. Before she left, she had a yachidus, a private audience with the Friedrich Rebbe. And she said to him that I have my husband's uh, authority to agree to the shidduch. My husband empowered me to represent him to acquiesce, to agree to the shidduch. And I agree with the condition. And the condition is that the previous Rebbe had to promise the Rebetzin Naden, a dowry. When a chosen gets married, especially a chosen of such a caliber, there's a, an exchange of a dowry, which is money that's put aside for the chosen to learn without any worry, so that later on in life he can establish himself. So the Rebetzin Chana said to the previous Rebbe, my husband insists on a dowry. So the previous Rebbe said, I have no money. So she continued and said, I didn't mean money. The Rebbe had told the Rebbe Tzanchana to insist that she get from the previous Rebbe a promise that the Rebbe would succeed him, that the Rebbe would take his seat after his Meyav Esrim. So the previous Rebbe agreed, acquiesced. So the Rebbe Tzanchana pushed and said, I want to have it in writing. So the previous Rebbe said to her, in writing, I cannot give it to you. And now there are two versions to the story. In one version of the story, the end was, Aber Chassidim von Alain Fashtein, Chassidim will understand themselves. And in Abzalman Grari's book, the version and the story ends with, Aber bei uns, Avort is Avort. But if I gave you my word, I will keep my word. Now, fast forward some 27 years, the previous Rebbe passes away, and there are more than one or two people who know the story. Abzalman Grari was a boy of 12 when this happened, and he was an orphan. And he was living in the Friedrich Rebbe's house. He was there when the Rebbe's mother came, and he was there when the Zichidis occurred. And he knew from all those years ago that the previous Rebbe had, had agreed that the Rebbe would succeed him. And he said at that time, Now, the Friedrich Rebbe passes away, and the Rebbe is refusing the position. And um, Rabbi Zalman Garari, this is also in his book, approaches the Rebbe and says to the Rebbe, I don't understand, how could you hesitate, how could you refuse the position? This was negotiated 27 years ago before you even married to the previous Rebbe's daughter, before you even married to the Rebbe, that the terms of the marriage were that after the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, you would be the Rebbe. Why the hesitation? And the Rebbe's response is very, very meaningful. He said, The previous Rebbe didn't tell it to me. The meaning of this response is the Rebbe knew the story. There's no question in my mind. The Rebbe knew that his father wanted him to be a Rebbe. The Rebbe knew that he was entitled to the Rebbe from the Baruch Sholem's line, which is a story I won't tell you because I've got to save some stories for another occasion, that the Rebbe was his. But the Rebbe was the previous Rebbe's chassid, not his father's. And consequently, in the Rebbe's own words, by mir, hechafar and shver nito. The Rebbe said to me, the, the greatest thing in the world is his Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Rebbe. And if the Rebbe was going to be a Rebbe, it was going to be only on the terms that he is sitting on the shtol, on the throne, on the seat, occupied by the Rebbe de Shver, by the Friedrich Rebbe. So he says, sure, I know my parents negotiated the Rebbe, but that's another channel. The Rebbe wanted that his Nesias, his Rebbe should come from the Rebbe de Shver, from the Friedrich Rebbe. And apparently the previous Rebbe never discussed it with the Rebbe. So the story goes, and it's also published in the Sefi Mei Bereshis, that on Lagba Emir of 1950, a minion of Hasidim went to the Oyel and said to the previous Rebbe on the Oyel that the Rebbe continues to refuse to ascend to the throne of leadership of Lubavitch on the grounds that the Rebbe de Shver, the previous Rebbe, never told him to take the job. While that day, Lagba Emir, our Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Ramash, as they called him then, was also on the Oyel. And when he came back from the Oyel, he didn't do anything, he didn't say anything. But that excuse, he never used again. The Rebbe never again claimed that he had no hero. There was a significant change. Tishrei, Tavshin Aleph, the Rebbe made a proposal, Simchas Teda, that every Chassid should deliver a minion of Yidin that they're being closer to the Ebishtet, which in those days was quite an undertaking. And as it got very close to Yud Shvat, especially the Shchei Shvat, when the Rebbe wrote several letters about Yartzeit, it, it was obvious that it was simply a matter of time before the Rebbe would accept the Nesias officially. 
And finally, on Wednesday, Yud Shvat, Tavshin Yud Aleph, 1951, it, if, as they say in the real world, it was all official. There was a Fabrengen at night, Tuesday night to Wednesday upstairs, Bamfriedik and Rebbe, I think. Then, of course, the Rebbe had his minion. In the morning, they went to the Oihel. And Wednesday night, it was Fabrengen scheduled for 8.30, Wednesday night, Yud Oli Yud Aleph, Shvat, Tavshin Yud Aleph, 1951. And the Rebbe was late. Fabrengen was called for 8.30, the Rebbe showed up at 9.20 which was very uncharacteristic of the Rebbe. The Rebbe was always very prompt, very punctual. And here he was, 50 minutes, 5-0 minutes late to his inaugural Fabrengen. Where do you think the Rebbe was? He was with his mother. And I don't think he was crying on her shoulder. I don't think he was getting cold feet. I think they were having a very, very important conversation. And of course, n nobody was there, so nobody knows what transpired. <clears throat> But I figure, I reckon, that the Rebbe's mother had some important things to tell him that she had heard from Rebbe from her husband, and the Rebbe brought to his Nesias. And the Rebbe came to the Fabrengen, 770 was in quote, packed, a couple of hundred people, that was the whole of Lubavitch, and it was a great celebration. The Rebbe was officially accepting the Nesias, and notwithstanding that for a whole year the Rebbe had been so hesitant, now that the Rebbe took the position, there was nothing equivocal about his manner. It was very direct and very obvious that the Rebbe had accepted this new responsibility, this new role, and he took the bull by the horns. In other words, the very beginning of the Fabrengen was a statement which the Rebbe explained, just like any body who ascends to a new position in the Western world has to make a speech and make a statement, and the statement has to have something extraordinary, something very novel and very radical and very distinctive about it. So the Rebbe says, I too, living in America, I'm not sure if it's the right thing or the wrong thing, but he made a statement about the Dray Ahavas, the three loves, Ahavas Hashem, Ahavas Teir, and Ahavas Yisrael, and their interconnectedness. And the Rebbe Fabreng, people said L'chaim, and it was very exciting. There was a chosley by the Rebbe Rabbi Nemtsev, who was an elderly man, he was in his 80s, and he plots to Rebbe 20 minutes to 11, he stood up on the table and he said to the Rebbe that the Sikhs are wonderful, would the Rebbe be so kind? And say a maimer. And the Rebbe smiled and asked him to sit down. And then the Rebbe opened the pamphlet, Basilagani, the, the maimer that had been given out a year earlier for what had then been the yard site of the Rebbe's grandmother and mother and now turned out to be the previous Rebbe's maimer of Yilula. And he opened up to the first page and he started reading inside. And he said... In the Maimed was the Rebbe to raise you given for Zayn Yehim HaHilula. Heip ter on Bosi Lagani. That's how we started it. In the Maimed that the Friedrich Rebbe gave out for what turned out to be his histalkus, his Hilula, his passing, he begins Bosi Lagani and then the Rebbe starts the Maimed. Bosi Lagani Achesi Kalo. Now, we have a tape of that Maimed and it's really worthwhile listening to. It's an ancient recording. 1950 is from a technological perspective hundreds of years ago because, you know, technology has evolved so incredibly. It was this big mess of reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that was somehow snuck into 770 under the ever-watchful eyes of Rabbi Chadikov so that this recording could be made. And you can hear the tape of the Maimir. And part of what you hear is, by a Maimir Hasidus, Hasidim stand up. Everyone had been sitting. No one expected a Maimir because the Rebbe started a talk, a sikha. And you can hear the noise of people standing up and the excitement of the Rebbe saying that first Maimed. And, uh, and you can also hear the Rebbe's emotion, how difficult this is for him. You can hear how he's breathing and pausing and hesitating, but as the Maimed progresses, the Rebbe gets into it, so to speak. It takes on a momentum and so forth. Now, the story is told, and if you believe every story, you're a fool, but there's no reason not to believe this story, although it would be nice if we could find evidence that Reb Meishe Groner, Rabbi Leibel Groner's brother, Al Shalom, visited the Rebbe the night before, Tuesday night, Yud Shvat. That, the night before that, Fabreng, and the Rebbe was sitting, looking at Svarim and writing notes in a notebook, presumably preparing that Maimir. It's clear that Rebbe, obviously, the Rebbe prepared the Maimir, and the Maimir has a very, very careful structure. In general, in my modern Basi Lagani, there is this structure, but it was especially true the first time around. During the course of the Maimer Basi Lagani, the Rebbe mentions the names of all of the Rabbeim, beginning with the Alter Rebbe, five times. 
He has two titus, two teachings, two Kabbalah Hasidic mystical thoughts from each one of the Rabbeim. The first one would be in chapter 1, Perik Aleph, and then again in Perik Daldin Hey, there are titus from each one of the Rabbeim. In addition, the Rebbe told a story with each one of the Rabbeim, which I'm going to read with you soon. A fourth occasion, the Rebbe simply mentioned the names of the Rebbeim. The Alta Rebbe, the Middle Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek, the Rebbe Marash, and the Rebbe Nishmas Eidin, which if you have um, access to the, to the, to the printout, it's, it's lines 153 and 154. He mentioned, Pushin, mentioned the names of each one of the Rebbeim. And finally, he also had them sing a niggin of each one of the rabbi. So the Maimer Basi Lagani, which I think is about 50 minutes, but I could be wrong, was stopped twice. The Rebbe said the first three prakam and stopped. And before the Rebbe could instruct what he wished, the same old chassid, the Rebbe of pops back up on the table and very excitedly and with great joy, announces to the Hasidim what an incredible opportunity this is, what an incredible schus it is, that we have a Rebbe, that the Rebbe has undertaken the Nesiyas, and he made a Shechayonu, and everyone said, Amen. The Rebbe also said, Amen, and again the Rebbe smiled and told him to relax and to sit down. And the Rebbe asked that they sing Niguns, Nigunim of two of the Rebbeim. And then he continued, and he said, Prakim Dal Din Hei, chapters 4 and 5 in the Maimon, and again the Rebbe paused, and sang Nigunim of two more of the Rebbeim. And then at the conclusion of the Maimon, the Rebbe had them sing two more Nagunim of two more of the Rabbeim so that all the Rabbeim were represented in the Maimah Basilagani five times. Two Tatus, one Sipur, once a mention of their names, and uh, once a Nigan. Incidentally, the Fabrengen was Wednesday night. Shabbos, there was a surprise Fabrengen, the first surprise Fabrengen, and the Rebbe mentioned the Baal and the Magid. And he sort of explained that in the first Maimah Basilagani, he didn't mention the Baal and the Holy Magid because when the Rebbe had gotten married, the previous Rebbe had invited the Rabbeim by repeating Tadis from each of the Rabbeim, only going back as far as the Alta Rebbe, not the Baal Shem Tev and not the Magid. And the Rebbe therefore felt, initially, that he should mention only the Nesir Chabad. But then the Rebbe said, I thought it over and I decided that I should mention the Baal Shem Tev and the Magid also. And this has become the tradition. Every year the Rebbe would say a Yudshvat, a Maimir, always beginning the same way, Bossi Lagani, mentioning a Torah from each one of the Rabbi, beginning with the Baal Shem Tev. And of course you know that the Rebbe each year would study, would analyze one of the 20 chapters of the Maimir Bossi Lagani, so that over the course of 20 years, 1951 till 1970, Tafshin Yeralaf till Tafshin Lamed, the Rebbe reviewed the entire Bossi Lagani. Lamar Aleph, 1971, the Rebbe started again, and he continued it till Memches, 1988. The last Basi Lagani was 12 days prior to the Histalkos of the Rebbe in Chayim Mushka, the Rebbe's wife. In the following year, Memtes, 89, there was no longer a Maimir Basi Lagani, um, but they reprinted the Maimir from Chavtes from 20 years before. This year, Tafshinayim Beis, we read chapter 2 of the Maimir Basi Lagani from the Fiyadik Rebbe, in the fourth cycle. So we're going to study the Maimodim of Yud Beis and Lamed Beis. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, the Maimir, this Maimir, Basilagani Yud Aleph, is a commentary on the first chapter of the previous Rebbe's Basilagani that talks about Ikesh Chine Betach Tainim Hoisa and, um, and so forth and so on. But in addition to being a a commentary on the mysticism of chapter 1 of the previous Ezra Basi Lagani, it is also the mission statement for our generation. There is no question that this is a very unusual discourse, Maimed of Hasidus. There are not many, or perhaps there are no Maimodim like this, because this Maimed weaves together a scholarly component in which the Rebbe elucidates and illuminates the first chapter of the previous Rebbe's Maimed Basi Lagani, but in addition, the Rebbe also uses this as a platform to establish his mandate. As you know, I'm sure the Rebbe introduced the mission statement of our generation by focusing on the words Deir HaShvi. Moshe Rabbeinich Hu HaShvi, V'chol HaShvi in Chaviven, Heyre Des HaShchin Alamat So you'll take a quick peek. It's um, line 38. 
I'll do a little reading, okay? It says, the previous Rebbe continues. Then came the seven righteous men. And step by step brought the Shekhinah back down to earth. Avraham Zoch. Avraham merited. He brought the Shekhinah down from the seventh to the sixth heavens. Vachuli, etc. Parenthesis. Umakat said Bazen, the previous Rebbe abbreviates it. Umasayim and concludes Ad ki Moshe, till Moshe Rabbeinu. Shahu Ashvir, that he was the seventh. And of course, we know from the Medrash Vachol, Ashvir and Chaviv, in all sevenths are beloved. Hairi de le Mate Ba'ares brought the Shekhinah back down to earth. So Moshe Rabbeinu, as the seventh, brought the Shekhinah back down to earth. And the Rebbe, in the next paragraph, which is line 45, says, Vihine. The Medish says, all sevenths are beloved. Rather than say, all beloved are sevenths. shows, indicates, what makes Meshach Rabbeinu special, is not who he was, but it's the sixth that came before him. In other words, being the seventh makes you special, not because of your own right, but because the sixth will come earlier. Because in order to be seventh, Invariably, inevitably, there must be six before you. So Moshe is special because he follows the six that come before him. Because he is the seventh, or by the virtue of being the seventh, that's his favoritism. In other words, his favoritism is not based on a choice. Retain his will. Vavidasi in his efforts, Kim Bazesh Hushvi, by the virtue of the fact that he is the seventh, Shazabamitada told this is from birth. So the Rebbe says Moshe Rabbeinu was the seventh because the sixth had come before. And the Rebbe goes on to say that we look at line sixty six now, please, near the bottom. We are the seventh generation. If you go back to the Alta Rebbe, we are the seventh generation. And our generation, the Chalashvin Chaviv, in all sevenths are beloved. The Im Hayes, that even though Shazesh Anach, the Medein Hashvi, are being in the seventh generations, who lay up in Bechira Seinu, we didn't choose it. For lay I the Aveda Seinu, we haven't earned it. Or become in Yonim Emshish Lay Kifira Seinu, and perhaps we don't even want to be here. Mikomokam, nevertheless, we must know, in a Chalashvin Chaviv, in all sevenths are beloved. In other words, says the Rebbe. We find ourselves in the heel of Mashiach. Moreover, the end of the heel, which the Rebbe would on occasion call the heel of the heel. For avoid us, we must know that our task is ligment to complete. Bringing down Shechina. The highest level of Shechina to the lowest realm. So the Rebbe makes the argument that our job is to finish the work of the six who had come before. So the Rebbe establishes a mission statement. And if you wanted to say it with the gloves off, so to speak, the Rebbe is saying we have to bring Mashiach. The Rebbe's undertaking, the Rebbe's role is as the seventh bringing the Shekhin al which of course means to bring Mashiach, which is why, of course, so many Hasidim say the Rebbe is still busy, because until Mashiach comes, he's doing his uh, mission. And a good portion of this Maimah revolves around this idea that as the seventh generation, we must bring the Shekhin back down to earth, and this is achieved by engaging with the Shtus, the Liyumaze, and Koch from Nefesh Bahamis, Umachem from the Ruth, Shtus de Kedusha, pardon me, to take the passion and folly of the world and transform it into passion and uh, favorable, positive hysteria, so to speak, of Kedusha, Shtus de Kedusha, and our mandate, our mandate is to make a Dira Betachtainim, to make this world gods by going where we need to go and doing what we need to do. And um, as the Rebbe is to say later in the Maimah, come to such places where people don't even know what Aleph Beis is. And bring the Abish to there. And in the course of this Maimir, in chapter Vov, which begins on line 112, the Rebbe begins to discuss the Ahavas Yisrael of the Rebbeim, the love of fellow that the Rebbeim had. And of course, he observes that the Rebbeim are not at all Chavereinu Beteiru B'mitzvah. The greatness of the Rebbeim is obscured by the fact that they were surrounded by people of such ordinary stature and station, 
But in fact, the Rabbeim's greatness is immeasurable and unknowable. And consequently, the very fact that we have a relationship with any one of the Rabbeim is an extraordinary act of kindness and generosity and humility. Now, Yoim Yoim says it this way, that Hasidus removed the loneliness, the elentkeit, from the world until Hasidus, the greatest of the great, were lonely. They had no relationship with the commoners. And the common people were lonely because they were disconnected from their heads, so to speak. And in Hasidus, there's no loneliness. A Rebbe has a relationship with Hasidim. Hasidim have a relationship with their Rebbe. This is not just a formality. It's not just a, a performance, a dance. This is genuine. There's a real connection between a Yid who is in a completely different station and level and world and the common person. And when we do things on behalf of our Rebbeim, as insignificant as we and our actions may be, we are kavayachal, joining with him. We're partnering with him. We are, a, a Rebbe needs Hasidim as much as Hasidim need a Rebbe. So says Hasidim. And in doing what the Rebbe instructs and inspires, we become connected to the Rebbe. But still, it's an incredible act of Hasidus Nefesh when a Rebbe, a Tzadik, a Nasi, a Yisrael, puts aside his interests to have Avas Yisrael. And the Rebbe did something very interesting, and I guess to a great degree uncharacteristic which is he actually tells a story of the Ahavas Yisrael of each of the Rabbeim. In other words, of all things the Rebbe chooses to discuss about the lives of our Rabbeim, he doesn't talk about their Torah, he doesn't talk about their Tefillah, doesn't talk about their mitzvahs, he talks about the Vihafta Lareyach HaKamoich. He brings the Medrash that God Almighty practices what he preaches, or to be more precise, he preaches what he practices. And Tzadikim Daimim Laboidim, that our Rabbeim, as holy and removed as they were from our levels, they practice what they preach, or they preach only what they practice. Whatever they tell us to do, they do themselves. And certainly, is high on their list. And the Rebbe actually tells the story of each one of the Rabbeim. And we begin on line 20, 120, I'm sorry. The dogma, for example. The Rebbe is telling a story of the Alter Rebbe of Avas Yisrael. He interrupted his davening. And he went and he chopped wood. And he cooked a soup. And personally fed a new mother. There was nobody home. The Rebbe told this story more than once. And each time he would tell the story, he would preface it by saying that in the old days, Hasidim wouldn't tell this story. The reason Hasidim wouldn't tell the story is because they were afraid of the Misnagdim's uh, uh, response, as if this was some kind of a violation of halacha, when in reality, it's not only not a violation of halacha, it is the halacha. The din of Chil Shabbos and Chil Yom Tov to save a life is mitzvah begadol. The Rebbe, on Yom Kippur apparently, left the shul. There was nobody home, everybody had gone to shul. He went to the edge of town where a woman had just given birth, and she was alone and she was cold. Made her a fire, cooked her food, and spoon-fed her, and then returned to shul hours later. This was an act of the Alter Rebbe for a private individual which didn't have significance beyond simply helping a person. And the Rebbe would, always tell, would often tell the story, and here in this particular case, he's underscoring the idea that the Rabbeim don't just talk about Avas Yisrael, but they involve themselves in Avas Yisrael. I heard once, at the Rebbe once, the Friedrich Rebbe was involved in helping people on a very personal level, and someone asked the Rebbe why he was doing it, and the previous Rebbe said, again, assuming my quote is correct, You cannot speak to the nation if you can't help the individual, and that's what this story represents. And I'm reading on now. Mikveid, Kedush Zad Morem Tzoyd, is also a story of Avas Yisrael from the middle of Rebbe. An individual, a young man, entered into his room to Yechidus. And this young man bemoaned, he lamented. About such things. The kinds of spiritual dilemma or deficiencies which young men are apt to struggle with. rolled up his sleeve. And he showed him that his skin and his hands were shriveled, his bones, 
his muscles were shriveled away. And he told them, because this is because of your sins. And the Rebbe qualifies this story. All of us understand how wondrous and exalted was the place and the avoid of the middle of Rebbe. And especially from being very far removed from such people. That have a connection to such deficiencies, to such flaws. Or may come or come still. The connection between the Middle Rebbe and his Hasidim was so strong. And because of deficiencies by his Hasidim. Which is not as it was supposed to be. Paul, Allah, Chalishus, Habrias, Beyes, that it affected the physical health of the Middle Rebbe. The Allah's made that his hands had shriveled. This is a, it's an incredible story. And it's a story of what we call in our culture his kashras. You know, one of the core ideas of Hasidus in general, and Hasidus Chabad in particular, is the incredible bond that exists between a Rebbe and Hasidim, and Hasidim and a Rebbe. I mean, this connection is so strong that the Alter Rebbe had a chassid by the name of Rabbi Isaac Homler, who once in illustrating the power of the bond between a Rebbe and Hasidim, and Hasidim and a Rebbe commented that he has proof that King Solomon, that Shleim HaMelech, was a non chassid a misnaget. And he says, had Shleim HaMelech been a chassid when he wrote the Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs, in which he's attempting to describe the unbelievable love that exists between God and his people, and his people and himself, instead of using the metaphor of a husband and a wife, of a romantic setting, he would have instead used an illusion of a Rebbe and Hasidim. Because the bond between a Rebbe and Hasidim is extraordinarily strong. Of course, you need a real Rebbe, <laughs> and you read, need real Hasidim. But it's the deepest connection that can possibly be between two human beings, is this pnimious connection between a Rebbe and Hasidim. And what's interesting and compelling about his kashras is that it isn't only true that Hasidim need a Rebbe. But whether we are comfortable with this or not, um, a Rebbe needs Hasidim. You know, the Gemara Mesech Teksubis, Labanaya needs A Rebbe needs Hasidim. And the more involved in the Rebbe the Hasidim are, the more the Rebbe can Rebbe. The Rebbe told Rabbi Hecht once, Al Vashalom, Rabbi Yanki Behuda Hecht, the who was talking about the Rebbe's opposition and how the Rebbe was putting up with it. And if the Rebbe wanted to suffer, in quotes, that was his choice. And the Rebbe said to Rabbi Hecht, I have as much strength as my Hasidim give me. And the more involved the Hasidim are with the Rebbe, the more of a Rebbe the Rebbe will be. Now here is a story of the Mittler Rebbe. And the Mittler Rebbe was extraordinarily holy. I mean, you know, measure a Rebbe against the Rebbe. Who was the holiest of the Rebbeim? It's foolish. It's, 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 it's a foolish thought to even entertain. But based on what we know, no Rebbe of all of our Rebbe was more parosh, that means more removed from the physical and material world than was the middle Rebbe. And there are a number of very famous references to this effect. And the one that absolutely gets me is that the middle Rebbe, who was a ga'an ha'go'inim, a genius of geniuses, never was able to appreciate the value of money. Now, who doesn't know what money is worth? To him, a single ruble note and a 10 ruble note and a 100 ruble note were pieces of paper. The idea that this had such an incredible value that you could, you know, kill for it, die for it, just escaped him. Because he was very spiritual. He lived on a different plane. And he never, ever learned to appreciate the value. When he gave money out, he never asked for change. He had no concept. In other words, it didn't, you know, like a kid with Monopoly money. It never registered in him how real it was. He was incredibly parosh, removed. And yet, the previous Rebbe says of the Mittler Rebbe, in quotes, was the Mittler Rebbe had zayin chassidim gegeben, had kein Rebbe nish gegeben, that the Mittler Rebbe gave of himself to his chassidim more than any Rebbe gave. And he also said that the Mittler Rebbe's chassidim had nish gefelt Mashiach. The Mittler Rebbe's chassidim were not lacking Mashiach. They were impoverished indescribably. No Rebbe had poor chassidim. And yet, the Rebbe says, 
that they didn't lack Mashiach because they lived in a messianic world. Chassidus. The connection between the Middle Rebbe and his Chassidim and the Chassidim and the Middle Rebbe was un- un- unbelievable, incredible. In fact, we know the Middle Rebbe was arrested, of course, and accused of being a Ganef. And one of the character witnesses which the Middle Rebbe's people brought in defense of the Middle Rebbe was a professor by the name of Habenthal who lived in Vitebsk, which was the nearest large city to Lubavitch. And his testimony involved the following. He said, I heard that this rabbi, the Middle Rebbe, speaks philosophy for hours on end and hundreds of men stand and listen and pay attention. And Habenthal said, I was intrigued by the idea that any person can um, engage an audience for so long in deep philosophy and keep their interest, he says, I just I couldn't fathom it to be real. He says, I traveled to Labavach on a Shabbos in the summertime and I encountered the site. The Middle Rebbe was uh, standing outside uh, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the warm courtyard of his base of Medrash and hundreds of men stood for hours on end listening to him to speak Philosophy, mysticism. Now, Habenthal, like many Russian intellectuals, knew Yiddish. He knew exactly, or knew to a great extent, what was being said. He says, a person had his hand on his chin and wouldn't move it for hours. A person had his hand on his forehead. He was just absolutely overwhelmed. He says, any person who could stimulate people intellectually, so many people for so long a time, can't possibly be a common criminal. That was the, the generosity of connection between the Middle Rebbe and his Hasidim. And yet, when there was a Hasid who was deficient in Avoida, the Middle Rebbe showed him how he was physically sick because of it. Now, he wasn't trying to make the Hasid feel bad. He was trying to show the Hasid how connected, just as the Hasid is connected to the Rebbe, the Rebbe is connected to the Hasidim. And of course, it goes the other way also. When Hasidim do what the Rebbe wishes, they enhance the Rebbe's health. I mean, I remember hearing from my teachers that the Friedrich Rebbe said once to the Bacharim, when he gets a report that the boys are learning well, he says, I eat less that day. If I have to normally eat a whole piece of bread, I'll eat half a piece because it physically affects him favorably. And this is the story of Abbas Yisrael of the Mitle Rebbe. And I read on. A story of Abbas Yisrael of the Rebbe that Tzemach Tzedek. He went before davening Lil Vizgamach to lend money. Li'ish to an ordinary man. which affected his livelihood. It's an interesting story. The Tzemach Tzedek had a chavrusa with the Yalta Rebbe. He had a partnership to learn three times a week with his grandfather, the Yalta Rebbe. There's a story unto itself how that chavrusa came about. It has to do with the and the Rebbe said, Chaya Mushka, a whole long story. But the fact of the matter was, he learned with the Alter Rebbe three times a week. Chesidus, special. When the Alter Rebbe passed away, Chavdal Tevis Tavka Fayin Gimel, the Chavrusa continued. <laughs> Sounds strange, but true. The Alter Rebbe would come to the Tzemach Tzedek three times a week and learn with him in a dream, I'm imagining. And this went on for many months until it stopped. The Tzemach Tzedek did not know why it discontinued, but that's the fact. The Alter Rebbe stopped coming to him. And the Tzemach Tzedek tells the following story, that it was one morning, and he was on his way to shul, and the katz at the local butcher comes to him, and he says to him, today's a market day, and they're going to be selling kelblach, calves, animals, and of course I would like to purchase an animal, take it to the shaykhet, and have the shaykhet shecht it, and of course, with the blessing and grace of God, the animal will be kosher, and I'll butcher this animal, and I'll sell it, and I'll make a little profit. Can you lend me four ruble? Four ruble was a considerable amount of money. It certainly was not a million dollars, but it was a considerable amount of money, and this butcher would profit, what would he profit? 50 kopecks? I mean, he wasn't going to get rich, but he would be able to feed his family with this loan. So the Tzemach Tzedek meets this man on the way to shul, and he says to him, Today's a market day, can you lend me four rubles? And says, so, Sure, come to me after davening. So Masada goes into the shul and gets ready for davening. He puts his talus over his shoulder, he's washing his hands, and suddenly it dawns on him. Here he is praying away, and the market day was in session. 
By the time I finish davening, the Tzemach Tzedek says to himself, perhaps there'll be no kelblach, no more calves left, the prices may rise, and so forth. Why should this katzev, this butcher, wait for me to finish my prayers? He took off his talus, went out into the street, found the butcher and gave him the four ruble, and went back to the shul. And he put his talus over his shoulder, he went over to the kia, to the sink, to wash his hands, and he saw the Alter Rebbe. After not having seen him for many months, Alter Rebbe's face was radiant, and the Alter Rebbe indicated, you know, helfen a yid fadin in apar perutus, in a kelbul, zain an ale shari shamayim pasuach lefonav. You do a yid a favor, bagashmias, just help another Jew. The spiritual reward, how this reflects itself in our spiritual possibilities and prospects and inspiration is uh, extraordinary. This is the story of a, did a simple act of Avas Yisrael and the spiritual reward which happened literally immediately. And I'm reading on now. Mikveid Yiddush Tadmor Marash There's also a story of Avas Yisrael and Rebbe Marash Shapan that it happened once at No Sabe Yichud Mikurat Le Parish He traveled especially from his area where he was uh, visiting a R and R, a place of recovery and rest, to Paris. Venivka Shalim Avrik met a young man whose name happened to be Klein, as we know the story of Om and he told him, Younger man, young man. Ya Today for wine stuffs the Jewish mind and heart. Zayid, be a Jew. and this man went home. And he couldn't find any peace for himself. He came to the Marash. He did tshuva. And from him came a family of pious Jews that lived in Paris that the Rebbe knew. Asher continues the Rebbe. You do why it's known. The Rebbe Marash valued every moment. When he said Chassidus, was also very brief. You do him on uncertain occasions. In the morning, the Rebbe the Marash was already done davening. So he valued minutes incredibly. You know, the Rebbe Marash once said of himself, which translates into English, I could have toiled for 23 half and a half an hours in a day. In other words, sleeping one half hour. And she, meaning his Rebetzin, for whom he had the greatest respect, knew nothing of it. And the Rebbe Marash used every moment. And nevertheless, he traveled a great distance. And he spent a considerable amount of time to help one person. Now this story is in the Sefer Asichas Tov Shin Hei, page 30. I looked it up. Rabbi Weinberg in the last couple of months told the story in the Living Torah for those of you who are up to date with the Living Torah. And the story was that the Rebbe Marash came to Paris with several of his servants and two very wealthy Hasidim and stayed um, at the Alexander Hotel, which was one of the most expensive hotels in the world. And it was a hotel for nobility and for royalty. The two rich Hasidim who accompanied him couldn't afford to stay there. They stayed at a different hotel. And he took a suite on the floor where the casino was, which was extraordinarily expensive. He took three rooms. And he went into the casino. And he watched a young man who was drinking, sipping wine and gambling. And he walked up to him and he put his hand on his shoulder. And he said to him, young man, the same quote we have here, Today for wine is poisonous to the spiritual mind and heart. Zayayid. And he walked out. Now this is, what, the 1870s. And the Marash didn't just say it to this man. He, he neshamed it. His whole soul came out. He, the Rebbe Shai Berlin, who was a relative of the Rebbe, said, I never saw my uncle so emotional. He was just so uh, excited, so emotionally moved by what he had just done. He simply made a statement to a Yid, which meant, in effect, do tshuva. But he didn't say it. He, the shama came out. So he walked out of the casino, and he sat down on what turned out to be a lift. There was a seat there. This is before electricity, so it was the age of mechanics as opposed to electromagnetics. 
and there would be a pulley system that if any person sat down on this particular seat, they'd be raised up to another floor. The Rabbi Marash was in effect uh, lost a sense of where he was and sat down on one of these benches and they started lifting him up and he had to apologize in French, as the story goes, and say that he had made a mistake and he went to his room. This Yid, this Mr. Klein, later joined him and did tshuva. And the Rebbe Marash commented that he was an incredibly great neshama, deeply lost in Klippus, and he brought him back to tshuva. So here is an episode of Avas Yisrael, where he went, in effect, to help one year do tshuva and spent a considerable amount of time. Now, there's a, the living Torah that Rabbi Weinberg Zosan Gesund relates is how he had traveled to Madagascar to meet one Jew. And the Rebbe writes him a letter that if the Rebbe Marash could have made a journey like that to meet one Jew, you could certainly travel to Madagascar to meet and to bring Yiddishkeit to one Yid as well. And I'm reading on now, line uh, 132. Mikveit, Yudush, Lord, Nishma, in a story of the Rebbe Rosh Shabbat Chilas Nesiyusa, the beginning of his Rabbistve, of his tenure as Rebbe. Shagoz, there was Gzeira Chadash. There was a new decree against the Jews, which was not new. Russia was a, a bastion of anti Semitism. I'm talking about Tsarist Russia. For Yetzor, Rechlin, Seich, Alvazel, Moscow, we need to travel to the capital, which was Moscow. Oh, Malayach al-Agadol, his older brother that Azon, the Shmasayidin, told him, Azman, Yoker, Etzlacha. Time is precious for you. Ve'ei, not the idea, hey, tifs, fasa, medida, you don't speak Russian. Deba Rashab was born in Russian, never spoke the language. Haraza, ha'yim, alumad, b'safes, well, that Azon spoke many languages. Ve'gam, adetzarat, l'chapesh, akedis, you need to look for contacts, acquaintances, which I have. So the older brother offered, I will travel on your behalf and do as you instruct. refused. insisted going alone. Vitzliachin was successful. That Azor was the older brother. That Ashab was the younger brother. And yet the older brother was the chosid. And the younger brother was the Rebbe. When they were children, it was always the other way around. But in reality, the younger brother was the Rebbe. The Razor, who was older than the Rebbe Rashab by two years, was his younger brother's chosset. And the Rashab used to say, Mein Bruder Zanivas Kenech Oichnisht. He was so moved by the fact that the Razor, his older brother, was his chosset, he would say, The humility of my older brother I can't imagine. So the Razor offered to represent. The Rebbe, the Shema Seyed, the Rebbe says, no, no, I'm the Rebbe, I'm the leader, I need to do it myself. And he went and he did it. And it was, the Razak could have done it fine, but the Rebbe Rashab insisted on in doing it himself. And the Rebbe finishes, and I'm reading now, on. There are so many stories of the Friedrich Rebbe. And it's quite interesting that although the Rebbe tells the story of each one of the Rabbeim, and the Torah of each one of the Rabbeim twice and their names, he doesn't tell a story of the Friedrich Rebbe. I don't know what the reason is, but he simply says there are so many such stories. Oy, does he start to say about his efforts? Allah says, Teva to do a favor. Bafi, Luli Ish brought it to a private person. Baruch, Nisei Begashmi, spiritually, materially. Veni, Achasat Meazer, he puts himself aside. Lay, Rakagashmi, actually. Not only did he put aside what would hear his material comforts. Kim, Gama, Ruch, Nisei, he put aside his own spirituality. Af, even though Shazesh, how you made if he made the personal, he he was showing this love and this kindness to Hinilei Zuba Vajla Yiklal Besog Shachaver Chavatero B'Mitzvahs. Not only was he not at all in the same spiritual plane as the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, Ela Shlai Hayy Shlai Berek Eklali was completely in a different category. And nevertheless, the Rebbe showed this kind of Avas Yisrael. There's a letter from the Rebbe to Rabbi Zevin from 1950 or 51 where uh, Rabbi Zevin asked him for money for a cause, for tzedakah. And he sort of apologizes to the Rebbe that he's bothering him, and the Rebbe writes him a letter. I'm asking you once for always that no Jew is disturbing me if he's asking me, And the Maimer continues and concludes by revisiting this original theme of the seventh generation. And that we have to go to places that are very remote. The Rebbe is describing shlichus and bring Yiddishkeit to these places and complete the task of being mamshech hashchina lamata ba'aretz, bringing the shchina back down into this world 
as the seventh from the Alter Rebbe or from Avraham Avinu, as Moshe Rabbeinu had been the seventh and had wanted to bring the Shekhinah back down into this world. And this Maimir, therefore, uh, speaks volumes. It's, it, it, you know, it's the Maimir of our generation and the mandate of our generation that every person has to find a way to do a skafia vis hapre and to contribute to bringing Mashiach, to bringing the Shekhinah and the Mata Baharitz. It should be now. The Maimon finishes, of course, with that famous quote, V'nis kezed zich mit nereb mdo lamata in aguf, o lamata me'asarat fochem, v'hu yigaleinu.